During her many years of rehabilitation, Jessica Taylor researched the science of the supernatural. And then she wrote all of her astonishing findings in a book entitled A Spiritual Awakening in Search of Hidden Jewels. And today we have her here on Awaken and Ascend to share some of those findings, to share about her journey and what she uncovered. So I am really excited for this. And not only that, but Jessica is also going to share how we can deepen our connection and really understand our connection with the universe. Jessica, I am so grateful that you are here and sharing this. This is such a vital topic, especially in the times that we're going through right now. So I appreciate you being here and sharing this with us. Well, thank you for having me so much. That's yeah. Great. Well, and Jessica, you mentioned about, and we just mentioned to everyone else too, about your many years in rehabilitation. So that's quite a journey in and of itself. And I'm sure there was a yeah. lot that led up to that and that's come after that. And I'm really curious about what it was that really lit your path. What inspired you on this book journey of you writing about your astonishing findings about the hidden jewels and what sparked your interest actually in the supernatural? Well, it was be simply be due to a brain injury. I I lost my memory for everything, wow. literally everything. I had to learn everything all over again, cooking, no matter what, you know, like somebody would put a note on the dial of the back and the front of the cooker. This is the back, this is the front, you know, that, wow. that's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. And when I had to cross lights, traffic lights, I had no idea the colors. I had no concept of the colors. I just had to follow people. Oh, wow. <laughs> some, they're, they're just a little samples of, you know, what person has to go through. Um, but I, I just decided I, I had, I was suicidal as well, which a lot of brain injured people are mm. because you can't cope. You, you've lost, you're a totally lost person. You don't know who you are. You don't know anything about the world. It's like as if you come onto a complete different planet where there's a different language, different way of life, you know, um, all of that kind of thing happened. And uh, I thought, no, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep on. So what I have to do, I, see, there was no, no CAT scan and no MRI at Toronto Hospital when it happened. Wow. It was over 50 years ago. Yeah. Wow. So I'm. Um, and then, unfortunately, we didn't have insurance for the hospital, so I had to go home, and that's when the trouble started. Um, like, with no help from anybody, I had to just plod on <laughs> myself, you know. To you just had no help. Just no help, no. And, you know, my husband at the time um, had no idea, and, and that's another problem that people aren't tutored about what happens to their brain injured spouse, oh. you know, or their children. There, yeah. there needs, there has to be tutorship. So that, because nobody understands it. They think you're just gone nuts, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's the lack of help as well. And of course I went and traveled uh, over to England to get help from my mother. And unfortunately, there was a wicked stepfather involved there. So that oh. just made it even more difficult. Um, and But anyway, the, the long story short is that I knew I, I had to wake up my brain. I just had to. I had to wake up my brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I took to, um, to make my memory, to help my memory, which is really bad to this day. You know, I just would write a, a, a little sentence and make myself memorize it. You know, yeah. some t at the beginning, I would just remember three words and then I would actually remember the, the sentence, you know, but it took years and years and years. And plus there was a neck injury as well. When I fell down the stairs, it was a steel plated door waiting for my head at the bottom oh, wow. of the stairs. And they, they actually the medical people said this is a miracle your neck should have been broken uh -huh. with the angle that you fell 
you know, because I went head first down 15 stairs. Mm, yeah. um, so I'm left with a little shake because of the, you know, it bent. Mm -hmm. Instead of breaking, it bent. So the expression, somebody up there likes you, <laughs> yeah. even though I don't believe there's somebody up there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I made myself then go and study. I thought if I go to the library and study, you know, just go into the research room. Well, I didn't even know I was going to the research room. I just said to the librarian, I, I've, I've had a head injury. I want to learn about life again. Wow. She said, well, who do you want to study? And the word just came out, God. And I mean, I was an agnostic, you could say, I knew nothing. I, I lost everything, all the dogmas that people are taught, everything about religion, everything was totally forgotten. So I don't know where this came from, from the universe somewhere. And that got me into the research room. And I just knew I had to read as much as I could. And they were Vatican encyclopedias. And it's like as if they were waiting for me and jump out of the, of, mm -hmm. you know, the shelves. And that made me start just reading like I was still really naive and brain injured at the time. And I looked up words like devil and Satan. And then I saw the original meaning, enemy and slanderer. And I thought, good grief. You know, this Jesus that everybody's talking about, mm. that seems like, they, was, they seem like words that Jesus would say, not devil or Satan. All of this, you know, was put in. And then I noticed that that the, the Vatican itself believes in reincarnation, mm. but they don't profess that to their people. And their, their word for it is metempsychosis which is really an unusual. Yeah, that's their own word for it, metempsychosis. And so I, I, it was the beginning of a study of the science of the supernatural. And then from their books, I found that that was the meaning of theology. But oh. the word science of the supernatural is nothing to do with it. And yet that's their own meaning. Hmm. So just reading book after book, and then from then on, I've studied other people's writing, you know, a lot of spiritualists who wrote great books, and uh, the science of the supernatural. Um, and I found out that there, that, you know, we humans are, we are supernatural people ourselves. Super is beyond natural. Mm -hmm. So in that we have a physical body and a metaphysical spiritual body. Everybody has it, you know? Yeah. Um, and it led me to just believe that without any, any doubt, to me, that is, I can't expect other people to, to believe what I believe, but that the universe itself has consciousness because it's alive. Mm -hmm. So everything has consciousness, every creature, every, every tree, every plant, no matter what. We all have that, that one consciousness, I believe, is what I, in the book I call God consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then... You know, I mean, in a way, what I wrote is was would have been blasphemous at some other time on the planet, you know, earlier years. But um, I said at my launch, actually, everybody had a good laugh. Um, I just said, well, I don't know what the Pope will think about this book of mine, because it's very contradic co contradicting, contradicting their philosophy and, you know, mm -hmm. what they preach and their dogmas. Uh, but without putting the religion down, I wouldn't do that. People mm -hmm. want to believe, that's their belief. And if it makes them comfortable, that's fine. But I, I made everybody laugh. I said, hey, yeah, you might see the Pope running after Jessica down the high street one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, and then, you know, I found out like their words like Elohim for, mm -hmm. for God, which okay. is male and female. You probably know all this. Well, the Elohim Council I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Male and female energy. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a masculine and feminine now. You know, mm -hmm. so that made me explore further and, and biblical, I found then that there's an awful lot of discrepancies um, in, in the Bible. You know, there are a few truths, but there are a lot of discrepancies. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the, the chapter Ecclesiasticus, mm -hmm. Ecclesiasticus. Not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, okay. 52 chapters are removed from all modern Bibles. Whoa. And I was so fortunate to met, have met and befriended a 90-year-old retired Roman Catholic canon of the church when I was studying in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And we became great friends. I just fell in love with him. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and here it is. He's sitting in a chair and Roman Catholic, and here's this brought up a Protestant standing up, and he said, Jessica, this is so unusual. You're standing, and I'm sitting. <laughs> it was kind of a lovely memory to have. He passed now a few years ago, never got to read the book. But what he told me, he gave me, he told me secrets that he knew, and he was taught that he was not allowed to tell the public. Really? The biggest one, which I'd never say on the air, because they really would get me, but <laughs> it's in the book. Okay. And it proves that there was no Peter. You know, no Peter answered Jesus when, when he asked, who is it? Who do you think I am? It wasn't Peter. It was Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Hmm. And that, you know, that just shocked me totally. Um, but then again, it, it made me go on to, you know, studying more people like Plato, Aristotle. Um, you know, they all believed in reincarnation. You know, all these famous people, they, these had, people had great minds, brilliant minds, these people. Um, and the same as... A, an early bishop called Bishop Origen. People just don't haven't heard of these people any more than they know of metempsychosis or the Elohim and you know or the missing Bibles. When I talk to people, they, they haven't a clue. They didn't know about the Vulgate Bible because that's what that clergyman shared with me: the Vulgate Bible of 400 A.D. And then I established that there were other books. One called the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, straight from Jesus's tongue, Aramaic to English. And that says an awful lot. And I speak about that in the book as well. Um, and then, of course, I went to study uh, theurgy, another thing people don't know about, theurgy. Theurgists, once were, people were called theurgists, in ancient times, there was people who were clairvoyant, true mm -hmm. clairvoyants, mm -hmm. spoon benders, hands-on healers, all of that kind of thing, or theurges. And the original concept of that was that people believed in two things, um, a worshipping a god, and then theurgy meant acting on the forces, the energy of that godhead. Oh. So that's how they tap in. And I know I must have tapped in myself as a theurgist to, to write my book because, I, you know, I, my memory is, is really so bad that when I was writing, I couldn't remember what I wrote in the last chapter. Hmm. It was a really difficult job. It was, but I persevered because what, what I learned myself helped me so much to understand the universe, to understand our connection with the universe, that we're all one, and our connection with nature, especially, you know, the trees and the, the, the universe, 
in general, just in, and Mother Earth is all united. It's all one big package, you could say. Mm. Um, that made such a difference in my life yeah. that I just saw. I mean, I, I had no intention of writing the book originally. I just wanted to learn for myself. And I think it was because my brain was wiped clean of all of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, one of one of my readers said the shit, Jessica, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that it, I, I was able to just think for myself, you know. Yeah. And of course, the studying the really the research lasted like 16 to 18 years. Wow. That's a lot of research. That's a lot That's of why books I, and talking yeah. to people and in filtering that through your own belief system and how it felt for you, how you experience this information and this understanding that you have now of the connection of all of creation and the energy that it yes. exudes and, and how much we're a part of that and it a part of us just brings up such a true sense of belonging. Isn't it, Jessica, that we're that we are in harmony with that, that we are united in that, that that's totally a sense of belonging. You know, there should be no fighting, no wars, no mm -hmm. uh, this ridiculous, you know, it's, it's not a white person not liking a black person or the other way. It's just ridiculous nonsense going on in the world. Yeah. But I think the time is for change. You know, there are an awful lot of people now turning from the church and studying spirituality themselves right and you know which is which is a good thing and i'm i'm amazed at how many people have been um tuning in to what's been happening with the dead sea scrolls and the gnostic gospels the gnostic mm -hmm. christian gospels mm -hmm. i mean you can learn so much from the nag hammadi um library you know, on, on true sayings of, from Jesus, not just Jesus, but Mary Magdalene and, and you know, Paul and the others. The, 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 you know, there's, there's conflicting words from, in the Bible, from, from those books of the Bible. You know, they're conflicting words. Yeah, and that's something that it seems that you really tuned into, Jessica, is those contradictions and the words and what they really meant and some of the words, many of the words that aren't really used, you know, and that also offers hidden messages and meanings and being able to bring this all together. And you mentioned about a real draw towards spirituality now, and a lot of people are leaving the church and the dogma and all of that. How would you describe a spiritual awakening? I guess it's physical and it's metaphysical. The mm. physical is, is the aspect of having read so much and understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. But metaphysically then feeling like you were on another dimension. You know, and, and I had experiences myself of, there's actually a comedy in the book where my, I was with cousins in Los Angeles who were looking after me in the early years. And uh, I, I kept saying to them at dinner one night, I don't want to live in the house. I was had a fear of houses. I petrified of houses, even my own ho house that my husband and I rented at the time of the accident. Petrified. It, it, the fear, you wouldn't believe how strong it was of houses. And so my cousins are saying, why do you why do you have such a fear? And their house was like a mansion in California, mm. you know, with big beautiful swimming pool at the back and everything else. And they would put the, you know, a shed lounge outside for me facing the house. I'd turn it away as quick as possible. That led to a bit of comedy, you know? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so one day they said, Why? Why are you so frightened? I said, because it's nicer living outside. Oh. Now, I was only learning to speak at this time. Hmm. And I said, what do you mean outside? I said, I was somewhere in my life where I was living outside and floating around. And there were no houses. And when I looked into that, I realized I was talking about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. 
where we go where the spirit, spirit you know mm -hmm. that i actually memorized that oh that you know that i can't get any other explanation to it that that happened you know yeah. so it was a matter of my cousin saying okay that's enough let's go and have some wine <laughs> you know <laughs> it's the end of that that's the end of that story um but then i i studied jesus's life i just fell in love with jesus everything i learned mm -hmm. and and it's mostly in books not the bible so much because there's too many distorted things what he said you know um they were taken up wrong you know mm -hmm. and uh, i just fell in love with him and uh, that made me study old scrolls about his life and also the fact that he, I'm totally convinced, and so are other people and writers, like Nicholas Notovich, the Russian, who was um, traveling in the East, fell off a donkey and broke his leg and went into, um, the, the, there were some monks in a monastery just nearby, and they rescued him. And of course, they looked after him, and he was lying in bed for so long, you know, resting his leg, they said, would you like something to read? Or he asked, if, could he have something to read? And they gave him this transcript about a holy man called Issa, I-S-S-A, Issa. And Nicholas read the whole thing. I thought, good God, this is a transcript about Jesus. In India, with the name Issa, Everything in that book, which I've promoted in my book for people to read themselves, um, every, everything about that man, Issa, happened to Jesus. I, you know, mm -hmm. it kept to be two identical people. It doesn't make sense. The crucifixion, everything, every single thing. So that made me study more and more and more um, about his life there. And I've written a lot about that in the book as well. Uh -huh. So like, are you saying then the different incarnations that Jesus had? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, not necessarily. Well, he did have that as well. But the missing years mm. that we don't know about. That's when he was in India and called Issa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Issa. Um. And he traveled, you know, there's no doubt. You know, I was in Mallorca, Mallorca at one time on vacation. Mm -hmm. And some people said that they know that there, that it's been handed down generation from generation. And they also said he was married to Mary, Mary Magdalene. You know, they're telling me, do you know he was married to Mary Magdalene? Mm -hmm. Like, we know that. And then there's been evidence from certain people um, who have, read more transcripts than I did and went physically and studied in India and they found a, an inscription on a rock that Jesus was there in 45 AD wow. and even the Indian government have said there's they have everything to believe that Jesus was in India without any doubt so are these some of the hidden jewels that you talk about in your yeah. yeah 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 i i call i call it all hidden jewels because that's you know that, that to me they they are jewels because the truth are jewels that's it you know mm -hmm. but they they've been hidden from us um and the other thing that i was fascinated with too was the fact that this consciousness that we have and that all plant life and animals and everything has are, are all interconnected as well. There, there's a tree in um, Egypt where some animals were biting up the leaves and the tree got angry and literally emitted not a poisonous substance, but a yuck, a horrible tasting substance so that they would stop. How does a tree know to do that? Yeah. Then the adjoining tree did the same thing. 
you know, I mean, how does that happen? That has to be a form of consciousness. Yes. You know, why would people think that we just have consciousness? It's not right. And that is what people call God, as far as I'm concerned, because that's what unites everybody, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. um, th there's a, a lot of stories about plant consciousness, and I've shared some in the book as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it, people should know this kind of thing. They, mm -hmm. they should know this. And then I read about a man by the name of, a holy man by the name of Satya Sai Baba in India. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these people that I mentioned, I talked to other people and said, do you have, have you ever heard? No, no. Have you heard of this? No. Have you heard of that? No. All of the things that I have in my book, have you? No, nobody. You know, but there must be this, uh, uh, just a few people on the planet that know, that yeah. study, those who study like I did, you know. And Satya Sai Baba was doing exactly everything that Jesus did. He raised the dead and everything. And there's a, a worldwide organization now of Satya Sai Baba, you know, what he did, building hospitals, free hospitals for people to, you know, get well in. And doctors from all over the world going there and giving free services to people and all of that, you know, free treatment. Um, and then from that, I established there was a lovely priest um, called, uh, all right, what was his name? Mazzaloni, Nicholas Mazzaloni. And he was a priest at the Vatican. And when he heard about Sati Sai Baba, he studied him. He went out to India every year for 12 years to study Sai Baba. And he compared him to Jesus. And I've written some of the comparison notes in the, in the book as well um, of what he found. I mean, he's just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, he was so brave because he wrote the book, even though they threatened him at the Vatican that he wasn't to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's now called A Catholic Priest Meets Sai Baba. And it's an absolutely powerful book. It's wow. a powerful book. Yeah, he compared them and totally compared them. And, you know, he also said, and one of the things that he was excommunicated, by the way, one of the things that his excommunication was because of this writing this book about Baba and also the fact that he said Jesus's name was not Christ. It wasn't Jesus Christ. It was Jesus the Christ. Christos, meaning metaphysical energy. You know, okay. you know, what he was, what he was, what he had, and how powerful he had. And I believe he was a third theurgist. Because he said, it comes through my father, right? So, he, like, it wasn't him doing anything. It came through the universe, mm. all his healing and everything. And that makes sense to me. And I know that won't be very popular with the present Pope. <laughs> but th that's my belief. I, I can't see any other reason because he was a, a mortal man like us, just a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, brilliant man. We just wanted people to understand who and what they are. You know, I'm sure you have similar feelings about him. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say, well, not just interesting, but it's important that you say, too, that there's very few people that have this understanding and this knowledge and this in-depth experience of all that you studied over those 16, over 16 years. Actually, it went on to 20. <laughs> went on to 20 years even and putting that together and then bringing this book together and not even remembering, you know, the chapter before. So I'm curious, Jessica, was there information that came through you as well? Or was it all from how you were receiving this knowledge from all, all of your research and your reading? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, strange things happened to me as well. Mm. I started seeing myself in different lives. I started zooming out into the universe as a different person, as a soul, and actually going back in time and seeing that 
a present boyfriend was actually my husband in that previous life oh. you know like all of that kind of thing yeah happened to me and at first when I'd be sitting on a chair and people around me talking or whatever and I'd literally have to cling on to the to the seat to hold myself down like I felt I was going I, yeah. I thought I'm going out in space where the hell am I going this this is frightening you know so I held on to the the, the chair mm -hmm. to stop myself going and floating out in public that there's a time when I didn't know enough about it what can happen right. and you know maybe I could have asked for projected for all I know <laughs> <laughs> but then a, a spiritualist who was helping me in the Isle of Wight is one of the places where I did an awful lot of research mm. the very spiritual people there in the Isle of Wight in England and she said you were actually, without knowing it, you were grounding yourself by holding that chair. Yeah. And I'm sure you saw, kind of jumped to that conclusion. I was yeah. grounding myself. Yeah. I didn't realize that, you know. Yeah, keeping yourself anchored in your body. and. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah being but able to it, it fascinates me and connect at the same time still being here in the physical. Yeah, but it fascinates yeah. me sometimes when I think, well, what if I didn't ground myself? Would I have kind of out there <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what would have happened I was just you know like <laughs> a lot of, a lot of my life was very sad because of trying to relearn everything again and yes. not be able to cope with every day losing my studio my 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 business because I couldn't do it and everything else but a lot of comical things happened right as well you know because mm -hmm. I wrote my memoir initially before this book now oh, wow. this new one and people said they laugh and cry throughout the whole story you know yeah um and it, it it helped me to you can never get rid of really traumatic things that happen to you when you've had a brain injury but it helps to release some of the trauma you know when you're having to write it and sometimes i'd be writing on the and the tears would be falling down while I'm writing it, you know, <laughs> onto the keyboard. Um, but then another time I'd be laughing my head off at something, you know, that happened. Um, but, you know, really, it's so difficult for people who've had an injury. It really is. And it's only when you've had one yourself that you know what it's like for others. Yeah. You know, I mean, the doctors try to help, but unless they've had a head injury, they don't know. You cannot see inside that head, you know. And I used to think to myself, if somebody could see in my, my poor brain, if somebody could see in there what's going on, yeah. you know. And so walking down someone, the street, I would kind of yeah. plea silently, somebody help me, somebody help me, oh, you know. Gosh, yeah. But then again, look what I accomplished in the end. It's amazing. And, yeah, it's a spiritual awakening that's that my life work now and I love when people come to talk to me and you know and they want to know things and I have that information for them you know I have to look up a lot notes and things because I couldn't memorize everything I wrote in that book yeah. it would be impossible and now my readers are saying that they're reading it two, two twice or three times to, to to you know to recall so much because I've written so much. There's so much that's in there. I have to do it myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we do too, right? With any book is that we go back to it for reference. And we go back to it with a different level of understanding and receptivity as well. You know, if I read something again or watch a movie again, you pick up on different things because you're tuning into it from a different frequency than you did the first time as well. Yeah. And you're ready to receive the other information that you need at that moment. So for those who haven't done the 20 years of research, you know, or gone through the brain injury, what is it that you want them to know? Like on the show today, what, what do you really want them to know and understand? You mean the head injured survivors or just people in general? In general, talking about the spiritual awakening and the hidden jewels and all of that, like they haven't that gone through your experiences or gone through that high level of research and inquiry. 
So you bringing that to them now, what are like two or three key messages or hidden jewels that you'd like people to know, to share? Well, that that would be my whole book. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my whole book. But yeah. for them to know that there's more to life than we've been taught mm -hmm. and that they are, you know, supernatural people metaphysically. We're not just physical, we're metaphysical as well because we have a soul and it's that soul then doesn't, the physical body dies, but not the soul. And that's how we can reincarnate and come back. Yeah. You know, and you know, you hear people in ancient times saying, oh, he's a good soul or no soul or, you know, that kind of thing. People talked about the soul yes. a lot. Um, and in Ireland, um, people, early people had a strong belief in it. And they, they would put a horseshoe on their front door to keep the soul away because they wanted the soul to go to what they thought was heaven. Mm -hmm. And they put a horseshoe at the door. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and some other countries as well, that they did things to hide the soul. And I believe that the color black came about from that. Because if you put black on, they thought if you wore black, then this, the soul won't see you so easily with the color black on you. And that's why people wore black clothes a lot. And to this day, some a lot of people wear black at funerals. That's right. Interesting. Yeah, it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. And why do you think people would want to hide from the soul? I, I, I guess it was the fear of the unknown hmm. before any of these books like mine came out and, hmm. and, you know, spiritual information, more advanced spiritual information than what they've been taught. Right. I would think, you know, that's why that, you know, but partly that they definitely wanted the soul to go you know not because they were frightened of this of the, the departed they just wanted them to be at peace you know rest in peace right right, right. on the grave right this sounds like an absolutely incredible healing journey that you've been on jessica and yeah all of the knowledge that you've sought out and been able to share with us today and of course much more of it and in more in depth in your book spiritual awakening as well which is out for everyone to access now and we'll have a link for that in the show notes and what about if they want to meet with you or talk with you directly jessica do you have a website or um, social i'm media trying to get somebody to start a blog for me Oh, because okay. that way people can talk, you know, they can chat with me uh -huh. on a blog. Uh, somebody suggested, I have a website, okay. jessicaetaylor.org. And that gives a little bit about the, the spiritual awakening, actually. Um, and But the blog would be nice. I just see like technical things with me. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. There's no way. And I'm not an Akan person. Obviously, I wouldn't have survived what I went through if I was an Akan person. Mm. But I, I have had to come to terms with the fact that I cannot do technical things. Like anything goes wrong with the computer, mm -hmm. somebody else has to come, my daughter mostly, you know, yes. <laughs> and, and I don't understand, it, you know, anything mm. technical. But so I think I'm more right brain. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was able to write. Yeah. And I was a good writer at school. Oh. And one nurse actually said, if you wrote essays and plays and everything at school, and you know, then that's something that would have remained with you even after the head injury. Oh, really? And that's why we were able to write because poems came to me as well in the middle of the night. And your ability to read, thankfully, was yeah. there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and one po one poem. Um, it's hard to memorize, but it's so beautiful, and I know it came from the Essenes. Mm -hmm. You know the Essenes, the Gospel of the Essenes, mm -hmm. 
And Jesus was one of those people. There's no doubt about that from what I've researched. Mm -hmm. The Essenes. Um, who totally believed in nature and, and, you know, unity of man. And that's what I love about the First Nation um, philosophy. That that's their thought, that we are all one. And they're one with nature, one with the tree, one with the ocean, one with the star, one with everything, yes. you know? Yes. I, I really like, I respect them for that very much. I do too. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And so what would you say to people who want to experience a deeper connection with all of creation, with nature? How can they start building on that relationship? I, I, what I did for myself was just like I have trees outside my one of my windows. And I mean, we have trees all over Ireland anyway, Vancouver Island, because it was just one forest before they turned it into whatever it is. And uh we have trees everywhere. I have a lot of trees in the garden. And I just go into a oneness with them. Mm -hmm. And I feel it. You can metaphysically feel it. But you, you have, you know, you've got to stop and do it, you know, and then you practice it. And it, it works. And I feel like I'm floating in between the trees, you know, wow. between yeah. the branches. And one of my heroes in this world is Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut oh. who started the subject noetic science. I know you would love that. Yeah. Or have you know about it? Noetic I know science. About noetic science a little bit. Yeah. I haven't. The science of the mind. Mm -hmm. When he was out in space, all of a sudden he felt oneness with everything: the stars, mm -hmm. the cosmos, every single thing. Yes. And, and, you know, and he then he started the noetic science, which is ongoing, even though he's passed away. And um, so the science of the mind, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't the, the, the mind be a scientific subject? You know, they thought it was in the body, but it's not. There's no mind in the body. It's out there, you know, just connect it. And, you know, I mean, people have used their mind powers to do so much. And the woman in India, they put a whole pile of heavy items on a big table and got her to use her mind to get swipe everything without touching anything. With wow. her mind, she swiped everything off the table. <laughs> Extraordinary yeah. power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mind power. We, we have that, but we've got to learn that our mind is not in there. You know, it's mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and be part of it. And I devised um, a little, I don't know what you would call it, exercise maybe. Myself, mm -hmm. I wrote it in the book where you can just go and stand out on the grass or whatever, preferably not concrete and feel Mother Earth under your feet. Mm. Forget where you are, so we're not all so segregated. I'm in Canada, someone else in Australia, someone else is in New Zealand, you know, forget mm. that. Feel that you're on planet Earth, literally feel the Earth under your feet and see the roundness. I actually, when I do it, I see the roundness and I, I lose myself from where I am because I know that's where you are. When you go outside, you are standing on the edge of the planet. You know, yes, yeah, it's something to think about seriously. It is actually, <laughs> and yeah, and then what you do is you feel yourself. Some of the people that I spoke to it about and got to do, got them to do it, said, "Oh my God, I'm huge," and what they mean is their spiritual self, their higher self, yes. is huge yes. because it, it expands with the universe. You, you know? expand into the fullness of who you truly are. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and it gets people not only that closer to Mother Earth and the universe. And I say you call the universe God and Mother Earth your mother, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. your father and your mother. And, you know, that gives that gives a beautiful feeling as well, it you know, does. yeah. and it's a natural feeling. You know, it's, it's, it's we are nature. You know, we're nature. 
the word natural is so close. We we're nature, and that's Super it. natural. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you said, oh, Jessica, this has been such a delightful conversation. Very intriguing, very controversial, I'm sure. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> hopefully you two won't ban us on this conversation, but <laughs> we're definitely going to put it out there. And I'm so grateful for each and one, Thank you. every one of you that have been tuning in for everything that you shared with us today, Jessica. And that's in the book. So everyone do check that out in the link below here, this video. And is there anything else you'd like to end with, Jessica? Um, no, it's just you're a lovely earth angel, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're beautiful what you do, because you're d doing what I'm doing. You want to share with people, you know, which is, that's what I want to do. That's what the whole book is about. I, I want people to feel the same divine presence that I do mm -hmm. since my research which was just for me at the beginning. But then when I thought, my God, I've learned so much, I've got to share it with yes, the world. Absolutely. And uh, so hopefully that's what's going to happen. Yes, let's hope that is exactly what's going to happen. So thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you again next time on Awaken and Ascend. I'm Jennifer. Bye-bye, right, dear. Bye for now. Yeah, you're lovely.